All right, it's midweek. It's Wednesday edition of the Morning Pit here on YouTube.com slash Pandalaricom. We made it to midweek. I'm here. So are you. I'm glad we can uh, start this day off. Talking a little pit sports here on YouTube.com slash Pandalaricom. You know the deal. We always ask you, like this video and subscribe to the YouTube channel, YouTube.com slash Pandalaricom. It's especially valuable today if you subscribe to YouTube.com slash Pandalaricom. You can turn on notifications, then you'll know exactly when we go live for our Pandalair show tonight. It's scheduled for 8.30 p.m. That's when we always do it. But last week, had to push it back a little bit. Ended up going at 9.15. You want to make sure you don't miss it? Subscribe to our YouTube channel, turn on your notifications, and you'll get an alert when we go live. So you don't have to worry about if I have to change it or my schedule changes or anything you know moves around. You don't have to worry about missing the show uh, because you'll get that notification sent to you. So like this video and subscribe to the YouTube channel and then head over and check out pantherlair.com, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. For all the latest pit sports news and, of course, coverage from training camp. We talked a lot of recruiting yesterday. Uh, but before that, on Monday, we kind of went through some spring camp observations. Since we're pretty much past the halfway point of spring camp right now, on Monday, we talked a lot about the offense and what we've kind of learned through the first two weeks, first seven practices or so of spring camp on the offensive side of the ball. And today, I figure we'll flip over and do the other side uh, because they are, I mean, they're past the halfway point. Um, yesterday was practice number eight. They ultimately have 15 practices, number 15 being the spring game. Uh, you know, so really you have 14 practices in the south side or 14 practices leading up to the spring game. So they really passed the halfway point on Saturday with the scrimmage, which was practice number seven. So they're really moving on. I mean, it, it, this camp is going pretty fast, actually. I'm kind of surprised. I mean, you know, from a media coverage perspective, we have about five more days, uh, you know, plus the spring game left. So it's really moving along. They'll have another scrimmage here, I guess, this Saturday. They'll be off next Saturday for the Easter weekend holiday, and then it's the spring game the following Saturday after that. So two two main scrimmages last Saturday and this coming Saturday um, that they'll hold and, and where the coaches will really draw a lot of evaluation. You know, I mean, I think day-to-day -day they build a lot of their, uh, you know, observations and evaluations and order the depth chart based on what they see day-to-day -day in the film room, in the meeting room, in the practice field. But those scrimmages do loom large. Those scrimmages do carry a little extra weight to see what happens when guys are in sort of a pressure situation. You know, it's 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 real. I mean, Pat Narduzzi wants the players to approach it like a game day and approach it like a game and, and play with that kind of intensity. So they had the scrimmage on Monday, or uh, this past Saturday. And one of the things that was most notable when we walked into practice yesterday, and and it's not these pictures are actually from last week, but you can see that the offense in these pictures is wearing blue jerseys. Well, after the scrimmage on Saturday, the defense was in the blue jerseys, and if you've been following Pitt under Pat Narduzzi, you know that that means the defense won the scrimmage. Whoever's on top gets to wear the blue jerseys, and 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 they call them jersey scrimmages. It's not just like if if the defense had a good day yesterday, the offense had a good day yesterday, they'll switch the jerseys based on that. It's about the scrimmages. Those jersey scrimmages like they had on Saturday, like they'll have this Saturday, are the opportunity for the offense and the defense to um, win that blue jersey. And that's what everybody wants to wear. The offense came into spring camp wearing the blue jersey, maybe for winning the Sun Bowl. I'm not entirely sure how they started off in that position, but the defense won the scrimmage on Saturday. And moved up, and they're now the, the the top dog, if you will. And so, after talking about the offense so much on Monday, I thought we could take some time today and kind of talk about what we've learned about Pitt's defense so far through the first half of spring camp. And it starts up front, where, I mean, I think you have some of the biggest question marks, you've lost some of the biggest veterans, and, uh, you know, you, you've got some of the biggest holes to fill, but you also have some of the most intriguing young players on the team. And and I'll say just sort of right off the bat. I mean, you know, you can run down the list of all the guys they lost. Haba Baldonado and Deslin Alexander and John Morgan and Kalijah Kansi, all gone from this defensive line group. Those are some big shoes to fill. And those are four guys who played a whole lot and uh, you know, were were quite productive. You know, as a group, they were very productive, and some of the individuals in there, Baldonado and Kansi in particular, were very productive players. And so you have big shoes to fill. I'll say, you know, pretty much across the board, it's it's rave reviews coming in about how the young players have done filling in for those guys. 
we we've talked about a turnover. We've talked about a transition, about a you know a new era as the players call it, a new era of pass rushers on this team. And and to some extent, and I think we talked about it when John Morgan announced that he was going into the the transfer portal. To some extent, I think Pitt needed some of those guys to move on. Hobo Bononato had more eligibility left. He could have come back. John Morgan had, had could have come back for one more year. Um, as super seniors, those guys could have played one more year. But if that had happened, I think Pitt would have run the distinct risk of losing guys to the transfer portal. Maybe someone like a Nakai Johnson or someone like a Sam Okunlola who says, I don't want to sit anymore. And Okunlola has only been here for one year. Johnson's been here for a couple of years. And he might say, man, I've been buried behind Haba and Deslin and John for so long. And, and that's fine. Those are good players, but I'm ready for my shot. And if those guys had decided to come back, you might have run the risk of losing someone like Nikai Johnson. And I think it's better for Pitt that they did not lose someone like Nikai Johnson. Because from everything I've heard, Nikai Johnson is playing really well right now in spring camp. And Okunlola is impressing a lot. Bam Brima is playing well. Dayon Hayes, if, if he puts it together, can be a freak off the edge. I think they've got really good pass rushers. Now they don't have the experience that Morgan and Alexander and Baldonado had, but I think they've got really talented pass rushers uh, in, in this group right now. And, and I think Charlie Partridge is excited about those guys. I think Randy Bates is excited about those guys. I think Pat Narduzzi is excited and I think they're going to make plays. I, I heard some ridiculous numbers in terms of sacks in the scrimmage on Saturday. I wrote this on Pantherlair.com um, yesterday that, you know, from what I've heard, Pitt's defense as a whole, and this isn't just the defensive line, but linebackers, obviously, an occasional corner blitz or something, put up a whole bunch of sacks in Saturday's scrimmage. Now, these are blown whistle sacks. All the quarterbacks are wearing red. Nobody's actually touching the quarterbacks. Nobody's tackling the quarterbacks. You see Phil Dracovic there in the picture with the red jersey on. Nobody's touching him, and if you touch him, you're going to be in big trouble. And so these sacks are... The defensive player gets into the backfield, starts to get close to the quarterback. Pat Narduzzi blows the whistle. And so they'll credit it as a sack. Would they all have been sacks in a game? Probably not, because as we've talked about, guys like Trakovic and Christian Bear and uh, Ty Diefenbach and Nate Arnell are, are athletic quarterbacks. They're big athletic quarterbacks. Probably the biggest, most athletic group of quarterbacks we've seen at Pitt in quite some time. I can't really think of a good parallel, actually. Or a reference point. Um, I, that's not to say that it's the best group of quarterbacks that we've seen at Pitt in a long time, but it's the biggest. In, I mean, they're all tall and most athletic group of quarterbacks we've seen here in a long time. They, they would have gotten away from some of those sacks. But the point remains that Pitt's defensive line was making an impact, often against some pretty good offensive linemen. Um, if When you go ones versus ones against Pitt's top offensive line, you're facing some pretty talented linemen, particularly a tackle, whether it's Mack and Salves or Branson Taylor or Ryan Bear. And again, by all indications, Pitt's defensive ends were making plays. And, and I don't take that as a uh, an indictment of the offensive tackles. I'm, you know, because I think those guys are going to be really good and really solid and, and protect Phil Dracovic and, and the quarterbacks this year and help establish the run game again this year because they largely did it last year. No, I don't take it as an indictment of those guys. I take it as praise for the young defensive ends and encouraging words about the young defensive ends. In the middle of the defensive line, I think Sean Fitzsimmons is going to be a beast. I, I mean, you, Sean Fitzsimmons from Central Valley, a redshirt freshman, played in a handful of games last year, preserved his redshirt. He's a guy, when you watch, I mean, just the basic individual drills that we get to see, right? Because the media, we get to leave before anything even approaching, or, or we are made to leave practice before anything even approaching football actually happens. But during the individual drills, the position drills, the defensive line drills, or the takeaway drills, or whatever it is that they're doing that we watch, Fitzsimmons just moves like a guy who's disruptive. I mean, when you watch him him hit the bags, when you watch him get down after a loose ball, when you watch him work through defensive line drills with Charlie Partridge, I, I mean, it's just, you say, this is a guy who can disrupt and, and be disruptive and be a real pain in the butt and a lot to handle in the middle of the line and, you know, somebody who can create a lot of havoc. And, it, you know, 
you obviously return three upperclassmen defensive tackles and Devin Danielson and Tyler Bentley and David Green. I think David Green actually might have a chance to be pretty productive this season. You bring back a guy like DeAndre Jules, who I think is just waiting for his opportunity, but I think it's going to be hard to keep Sean Fitzsimmons off the field. I think he's going to be really, really good. Um, and and, and a, a, another productive defensive tackle. Uh, he just got, he's got that way about him. <laughs> and that's the best way I can describe it. So I think there's really positive reviews up front out of that defensive line. It might take a little while. Like right off the bat, they may have games where they're getting beat either by things that they don't recognize or things that just experience, you know, th- their lack of experience is going to leave them vulnerable to certain things, particularly the ends. And and Pitt will probably give up some plays because of that. I mean, more often, you know, we've seen plenty of times where a young or an inexperienced defensive end gives up a big run because he doesn't understand, you know, gap and, you know, assignments and responsibility and how to kind of play his role. And that's something you have to learn largely through experience. Some guys get it right away, but most guys, it takes a little time for them to settle down on the field and understand that they need to do their job. And so you're probably going to give up some big plays, but I think guys like Johnson, Dayon Hayes, Oakland Lola, Bam Bremer, I mean, these guys are going to make plays. They're going to get after the quarterback and make plays in the backfield. I'm, I'm really confident about that. In the middle of the defense, as we kind of work our way back, uh, it, it, it's it's the difference that a year makes. Where a year ago, we were talking about, all right, it's Servasier Dennis and a bunch of who? You know, a, a bunch of guys that you may know some of their names and you may not, but you know they haven't played much, if at all. You fast forward a year, and now you're looking at, oh, Shane Simon, yeah, he started every game last year. Oh, Bengali Kamara, yeah, he started every game last year. Oh, Solomon DeShields, yeah, he played in every game last year. Oh, Brandon George, he's been around for like seven years. <laughs> you know, he didn't play much last year because he got hurt, but he's been around a long time. And we'll talk about the depth in a second, but just if we go with just the three of Kamara, Simon, DeShields, you know those guys. You know who they are. You've seen them on the field. They played every game last season and they were a big part of the defense. And you know that it wasn't always good. You know that it wasn't always pretty. You know that early in the season, um, you know, Kamara, for all of his athletic ability, got beat, you know, made mistakes. Uh, You know, some of what I was just talking about with the defensive ends of being inexperienced and not really being, you know, settling in on the field and doing his job uh, ended up leading to some big plays for the opponent. But I think by the end of the season, he was playing at a pretty high level. I think Shane Simon became a real steadying force for this defense. Played some middle linebacker places in place of Servassier Dennis, and is probably going to play there again this season. Um, but just as you know, I, I think after transferring from Notre Dame, he's been here for a year. He knows the defense. I think he's respected by his teammates, and I think he's a guy who will be able to run things in the front seven from that middle linebacker spot. And then DeShields is a guy who also played in every game last season. He played on defense in every game last season. Just most of his snaps were not in the base defense. He spent most of his time working in that defensive sub package that they have, the Delta, uh, where he was kind of an outside pass rusher. You know, so he ends up with five tackles for loss and four sacks, a couple passes defended, and it it almost all came out of blitzing from that Delta package. Now, there's going to be a big step for him a big change for him an adjustment and growth that's needed because he's going to be playing in the base defense a whole lot more playing the money linebacker position which is the boundary side of the field the short side of the field Uh, but I think that's a really good spot for him because it it does blitz a lot the money linebacker likes to get into the backfield and the coaches like doing that the star linebacker where Bengali Kamara is playing the field side the wide side of the field it's more responsibilities there's more coverage that has to happen out there there's more reading De Shields, though, I think you know there, there's a certain element of pinning your ears back and just getting after the quarterback. Uh, not every play, but a lot. And I think that's a great role for him, in addition to having the athleticism to certainly to run with tight ends, probably to cover some guys out of the slot, and, and to play you know, in space to some extent. And I think he's going to be more comfortable this year after being on the field as much as he was last season. I think he's ready to move into a bigger role with the base defense. And and I'm I'm remarkably confident, optimistic, and bullish about a trio of Kamara, Simon, and DeShields. I think those guys can be really good. 
Uh, and I think you saw each of them playing really well at various points last season. You put it all together for a consistent 12, 13, however many game season, and I think you'll get really good play out of the linebackers. Now, the question is depth. And, and this is a question I don't even know the answer to at this point, honestly. Um, Brandon George is there to be a backup at middle linebacker or money linebacker. Uh, I, I think there's enough overlap between the middle linebacker and money linebacker roles that if something happens to Shane Simon and Brandon George needs to step in, that's cool. He's got it. If something happens to Solomon to Shields and Simon needs to move to money and George steps in at middle or George moves into the money, that works as well. If something happens to Bengali Kamara, Solomon to Shields is being cross-trained at both outside linebacker positions, so he could slide over. And, and you could end, still end up with George and Simon and to Shields playing. Those four, I think you feel good about. You feel confident in. They've played a lot. They've been around a long time. They're older. They're smarter. They know what's going on. I just don't know who's behind them. I mean, you'll probably need a fifth linebacker, right? At some point, you're probably going to need a fifth linebacker to go on the field. You can't just go with those four all game long, every game. You're going to have to rotate at some point, and I'm not really sure who the top options are at at the fifth linebacker. I mean, Braylon Lovelace, a freshman from Leechburg, as a possible second team guy? Yeah, maybe. You know, Jordan Bass, maybe, when he comes in. Aiden Henningham is out, is out there. I'm, I'm not really sure what his role is. Kyle Lewis, I, I think, can be a really, really good player. He was hurt a lot last season. He needs to stay healthy. He can maybe be in the mix. So you've got a, a pretty good four, but you need to develop depth. And that's going to just kind of happen when it happens. You, you, know, you hope you can get lucky and keep all four of those top linebackers healthy and on the field all the time. But you're going to need that depth to come out at some point. And when it does, I don't know what it's going to look like. So that's probably one of the biggest remaining questions here for the defense. Now, of course, as we get back to the defensive backfield, you've got a couple more questions lurking there as well. No questions about the corners. Marquez Williams and MJ Devonshire and AJ Woods. I mean, those guys are solid. They're set. You know what you got. You know what you're going to get. They played all last year. They're good players. They know how to play in this defense. They're going to give up plays and they're going to make plays. That's what corners do in Pat Narduzzi's defense. We know that, right? So there's no questions there. Uh, you know, Maybe you're just watching to see who that fourth corner is that steps up. Is it Rylan Gandy or Noah Bigelow? Is Rashad Battle ready to be in that mix? Somebody will pop up there. Noah Bigelow's had three takeaways so far in, in uh, spring camp. It's most of any individual defensive players. So maybe he's the guy. We'll see. But that's the biggest question mark about the corners is who steps up behind Williams, Woods, and Devonshire. The question, of course, is at safety, where you lost Eric Hallett and Brandon Hill, and you're trying to find guys to replace them. And, you know, the first two guys off the bus right now are, you know, PJ O'Brien at the free safety and uh, uh, Javon McIntyre at the strong safety. They're both young. They're both uh, kind of lacking in experience, although they both saw more time last season. And, and you know, for McIntyre, particularly down the stretch last season, but they're going to be really playing for the first time in prominent roles on a consistent week-to-week basis this coming season, which means at those safety spots, I mean, you know it. You, you know what the deal is. There are going to be mistakes, and there are going to be blown coverages, and there are going to be big plays that are given up. Pat Narduzzi mentioned about how the, you know, one of the big pass plays that UCLA had was because Javon McIntyre blew the coverage and blew the assignment. You're going to have some of those plays with these younger players. Eric Hallett and Brandon Hill did it. And then they became really, really good. DeMar Hamlin did it, you know, and then he became really, really good. Um, even Jordan Whitehead didn't really execute the the coverages all that, you know, perfectly in 2015. But obviously he was really good and became great. Um, and he's still playing his career right now. So you're going to have to live with some of those mistakes. You'll have guys that can rotate in. Um, you know, the Donovan McMillan is right there near the top of the list. Probably as a a, a, a rotational guy with McIntyre at the boundary safety spot. Uh, McIntyre probably could learn both of those safety jobs, uh, free and boundary. But, you know, you don't have really any experienced guys. And, and that's what you're going to be lacking the most at safety, which is a pretty crucial position to have some experience. You know, we've seen this defense with really experienced safeties, and we've seen this defense with safeties who maybe don't have as much experience. And it's a stark difference. 
and, and it can be a pretty rough transition period at times. Now, I think O'Brien and McIntyre have both played some, you know, enough that they're, they're not coming in completely green. Um, and I think they're also both really good athletes and really good players. You know, Stefan Hall is another one who's, who's been out there and, and played well and, and I think made plays. So it, it, there, there's a certain level of excitement in seeing new guys, you know what I mean? Seeing new players who haven't gotten as much playing time in the past and, and it's their turn now to step into the prominent roles. But it's also going to give you some, some uh, uh, you know, palpitations, I guess would be the way to say it. It's going to be concerning at times because they're probably going to make mistakes. But, you know, I, I think the coaches are, are kind of working through that right now, feeling like, uh, you know, probably frustrated at times with, with what they, you know, Pat Narduzzi mentioned that on Saturday, uh, P.J. O'Brien had a uh, unsportsmanlike conduct penalty, which he's not happy about. And, 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 I mean, that's probably a big thing that O'Brien needs to focus on is uh, kind of managing his fire and his energy because he certainly took a few of those last season as well. And that was on special teams. Now you're in a prominent role on defense, you know, maybe the most prominent role on defense as the free safety. You can't be taking stupid 15-yard penalties. You need to get that under control. Uh, but the ability is there. The talent is there. Uh, you know, the athletic ability is there for both O'Brien and McIntyre. Um, they just need to make up for it with some growth, some development, some maturity, and some experience. And those things are only going to come with time. So, you know, I, I think on some of these spots, the defensive ends, the safeties, you're probably going to have points early in the season where you say, what are you doing? And it's going to stress the coaches out a lot more than it stresses you and me out. But they're going to be saying the same thing. What are you doing? And I think by the end of the season, we're going to say, yeah, that 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 guy's really good. You know, that, that kid can really play. He's a really talented safety or defensive end or whatever it may be. So, you know, we're at a point now where I think with Pat Narduzzi's defense where we just kind of expect it to be good um, because it has been for about six years in a row now. And I, I don't see any reason for it not to be, again, uh, you know, it might have a period of transition early on with some of the less experienced players, but on the whole, I think you can expect this unit to play at a really high level once again in 2023. So that's what we've learned about the defense so far in spring camp. Of course, we'll do it again at the end of uh, camp. We'll do kind of what we learned on offense and what we learned on defense and, uh, you know, recap everything there, but that that's sort of where we stand. If you want to catch up on the, um, you know, the offensive episode, it was right here on youtube.com slash pantherlurcom. We did that on Monday. Of course, yesterday we talked a lot about recruiting in the wake of Pitt landing six commitments in the month of March, bringing the recruiting class up to 10. So you want to check that out as well to uh, kind of get up to date on everything going on in Pitt recruiting. We'll have some basketball talk later this week. We'll have a mailbag episode on Friday. That's always fun. We enjoy doing those. And, uh, yeah, and then if, if big news comes up, big news breaks, we'll uh, change the format and change the schedule and do something different. But we will be live tonight, 8.30 p.m. right here at youtube.com slash pantherlair.com for the weekly Pantherlair show. So make sure you tune in for that. It's always, uh, it's always fun. We can sit down and have a little conversation, a little back and forth right here at youtube.com slash pantherlair.com. So make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Make sure you like this video. Make sure you turn on the notifications so you get an alert when we go live. And we will talk to you tonight at 8.30 p.m. for the Panther Lair Show right here on YouTube.com slash PantherLairCom. Until then, I hope you have a great Wednesday. Hope your week's been good so far. I hope it uh, continues to be so. We're over the halfway point here and heading toward Thursday. So we'll uh, talk to you tonight for the live show, and then we'll be with you tomorrow morning for another morning pit right here on YouTube.com slash PantherLairCom.